Our scripture reading today is from Matthew chapter 6. I begin with verse 25 from the Inclusive Bible. That's why I tell you not to worry about your livelihood, what you are to eat or drink or use for clothing. Isn't life more than just food? Isn't the body more than clothes? Look at the birds in the sky. They don't sow or reap. They gather nothing into barns, yet our God in heaven feeds them. Aren't you more important than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add a moment to your lifespan? Stop worrying, then, over questions such as, what are we to eat, or what are we to wear? Those without faith are always running after these things. God knows everything you need. Seek first God's reign and God's justice, and then all these things will be given to you besides. Enough of worrying about tomorrow. Let tomorrow take care of itself. Today has troubles enough of its own. I love this passage from Matthew. It has meant a great deal to me for as long as I can remember, all the way back to youth group at the Bible church I grew up in. Come along with me if you know this song. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. In this passage from Matthew's imagination, Jesus urges his listeners and us not to worry. Not to worry about we're going, what we're going to eat or drink or what clothes we're going to wear. And you know what? In large part, I don't. I don't worry about having enough to eat or having clean clothes to wear, clothes that fit me. I don't worry about any of these things, not because I am spiritually evolved, mind you, but because I've always had them. And yes, I am aware of my privilege that I've never had to worry about food or shelter or clothing. I worry about other things. In fact, if I were to rewrite this passage from Matthew for me, Jesus would tell me something like this, Leanne, stop worrying over questions such as, are we going to have another stretch of freezing temperatures this winter because we've done nothing to address the grid? Or are we pretty much screwed for the next 10 years in elections because the redistricting maps were just redrawn based on data from the last mismanaged and flawed census? I worry is Senate Bill 8, the Texas law that essentially bans all abortions in Texas, just the beginning of an ever-broadening dismantling of women's rights? These are the things I worry about. And in my imagination, Jesus tells me, enough of worrying about what will happen tomorrow. Let tomorrow take care of itself. Today has enough troubles of its own. And he is quite right about that last part. Today has enough troubles of its own. What do you worry about? I'm not going to ask you to share. It's just an invitation to reflect on the triggers for your anxiety. What are the things that, if unchecked, might even draw you toward despair? Knowing you as I do, knowing this church as I do, I can imagine a very long list. I'm not going to go through that list right now because we've just heard from Laurie Simmons and the children not to worry, but to be happy. (laughs) 
just a little further, waiting for the confidence monitor. There's a little issue with that. <laughs> Go back just a little bit more, please. There we go. Yes, thank you. <laughs> We've just heard from Lori Simmons and the children, not to worry, and I do so want to believe them. To some extent, though, most of us probably at some point worry that every little thing won't be all right. And sometimes we might even fall into despair. Of course, we know that despair doesn't help. Despair, if anything, lessens our ability to respond in positive ways. When despair takes a hold, is there anything we can do to shake it? Well, the answer to that question is probably different depending on who you ask. People have different capacities for resilience. But chances are most of us can benefit from the wisdom of the great theologian, Joan Baez. <laughs> she said, action is the antidote to despair. Action is the antidote to despair. I mean, action isn't always the answer. There is a time to act, there's a time to reflect and be present to whatever is going on. But when you've been present to, <coughs> excuse me, pain and struggle, and challenge, then it may be time for a deliberate action that can put you in a more positive, hopeful mindset. I know this to be true. Let me give you an example. I've long been engaged in the struggle for women's reproductive freedom. If a woman cannot take as much charge as possible of her own health, including when to reproduce and when not to, then a woman is not free. I've heard so many compelling stories about why abortion needs to be an option for women. The accomplished professional woman about my age who was date raped in college, she was not ready or able to be a mother, and she was so grateful that she was able to have an abortion and not drop out of school and change her life forever. <coughs> or the woman in her late 30s who at midterm pregnancy found out that the baby had a severe disorder and would not survive. Or the woman whose husband had been laid off, they and their four children were living with his parents when she found out that she was pregnant again. Or the young Latina migrant worker whose boss made it a prerequisite of her employment to have sex with him at will. What happens when she gets pregnant? Or the woman who finds herself pregnant, any woman who finds herself pregnant and who feels that she is unable to adequately care for a child. All of these situations and so many more are of real women sometimes facing heart-wrenching decisions. We need to trust them, to trust women to make decisions for themselves. I'm not saying that all women who find themselves in these situations will choose abortion, or that any of them would, just that it needs to be a viable option for them to consider. Why do women seek abortions? There are lots of reasons. It's most common that they used contraception, but it failed. And let us make no mistake, restricting abortion does not stop women from having them. Desperate women who cannot fly to another state are forced to seek out backroom abortions done by someone unlicensed, untrained, perhaps in unsterile conditions. This has been the reality for countless women in Texas and elsewhere, particularly for poor women with few resources. It's an age-old story. The most vulnerable people are the most harmed. I also worry about the children who are, will soon be born with inadequate support systems, without the care and nurture a child needs. What happens to all of those children? That's what I worry about. Well, some of the things. 
anyway. And since I worry about them, I've worked with Planned Parenthood and Whole Woman's Health Clinic, not far from here. I've learned more about what it's like for them. And I want to share it with you through the perspective of someone who works there. I'm here with Sonia Miller. Sonia is Director of People and Culture at Whole Woman's Health. Sonia, thank you for your time and for sharing a little bit about the work that you do. I first learned of your wonderful clinic several years ago when you had an open house at the clinic in Fort Worth. You invited folks to tour the clinic and learn more about the services you provide. And I also remember at some point in the past being involved with other clergy to bless the clinic. The Fort Worth Clinic? Yes, yes. 2017, we did that. Oh, okay. Um, I really think it's just a wonderful place. So can you share a little bit about what what happens there? Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad to be doing this with you. And it was um, wonderful to reconnect with you again. And um, our clinic in Fort Worth has uh, prior to September 1st in Texas was our busiest clinic for whole women's health. We have mm -hmm. nine clinics. Um, four in Texas and uh, four um, brick and mortar clinics throughout the country. And then we offer virtual services in uh, Minnesota, mm -hmm. uh, New Mexico, and Virginia right now. And so mm -hmm. uh, Whole Women's Health Fort Worth Clinic was kind of our biggest clinic um, seeing the largest number of patients. We uh, see patients there for uh, medication abortion and for surgical abortion, uh, uh, multiple, you know, across several days. And, and in Texas, to receive an abortion, every patient has to come two days because of other laws that uh, require um, a two day visit. So, uh, yeah. I mean, we're an independent pro uh, abortion provider founded by Amy Hagstra Miller. Uh, Whole Women's Health was founded in 2003. And so we've been providing compassionate abortion care uh, for a long time now. Wow. Well, given the new Texas law, these must be difficult days. What kind of challenges does the clinic and the people involved there face? Well, the biggest challenge is that the majority of the patients that we were seeing prior to September 1st we can no longer provide the care, the health care that they are seeking, because um, any person who uh, comes in and we detect fetal heart tones, we have to turn away. Uh, we cannot provide uh, their abortion. So for most people coming in, that means if they're over six weeks, um, we can't provide them care. So we are providing abortions. We're still open. All our Texas clinics are open but we've seen about a 70 to 80% reduction in the number of patients that we can actually provide the abortion care that they are seeking. Mm -hmm. What about, um, do you typically have protesters or demonstrators at the clinic and mm -hmm. is that? Yes, all our Texas clinics have uh, protesters on a regular basis. Um, the, the doctors and the staff get to know them as the regulars. But since September 1st, we've seen a big uptick in uh, uh, protesters and our Fort Worth clinic has uh, always been one of our more protested clinics. Mm. So um, yeah, the protesters um, uh, are pretty vocal at our Fort Worth clinic. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, that's why doing things like working with a congregation like yours to partner um, is so important because that message that's coming to the patients through the protesters is that people of faith yeah. do not want them to have the abortion care that they're seeking and that there's something wrong with them for seeking that care. Um, yeah. That's the um, dominant narrative in Texas, right? Yeah. That people of faith don't approve of abortion, but the reality is the majority of Texans and Texans of faith do want uh, people to have access to reproductive health care uh, and abortion access. And so uh, that partnership that we, if we can um, build that community support 
for the patients and the staff is really important to help change that culture and that message that the patients are getting as they're coming uh, into the clinic and leaving the clinic and that the staff hear all day long because they can hear the protesters inside the uh, clinic Gosh, a lot of times. So um, I can't imagine how difficult that would be for your staff and your your doctors and nurses and the clients. Um, is there anything that gives you hope that keeps you going through those difficult times? Yeah. So one of the things that I would say is that it has been a little bit in addition to the last question, it, it has been particularly harder for the staff and the doctors to um, be working now post the passage of SB8 because they're consistently having to tell people no and to hear their stories and carry those stories um, with them. And so, you know, they're there to do the work that they're trained to do as medical professionals and that they have a deep passion for doing and to then have to hear the stories of, of people coming in. That, that makes it hard, right? M much harder than it is just dealing with the protesters in a culture that appears to be against abortion. But what gives us hope are uh, the connections that we can make with the community. Uh, the October 2nd, you know, I don't know, were there 60 rallies across the country that were um, all uh, for abortion access? You know, the Women's March mm -hmm. that became all, you know, the, the recognition that more people are beginning to speak up and tell their own stories and, and be, um, you know, engaged and, and want to uh, support uh, abortion access gives us hope. Um, and, and just the daily working with patients is another thing that, that gives mm -hmm. our doctors and our, our staff hope. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for just taking a few minutes to visit on behalf of our congregation, a First Congregational Church, your Fort Worth neighbors, for the Fort Worth Clinic at least. I just want to thank you for the work that you and your staff do and the compassion with which you serve our community. Thank you well, so thank much. Thank you so much. It's been wonderful talking with you and I look forward to working with you all. Too often, congregations, even progressive faith communities, perpetuate a conspiracy of silence around reproductive health issues, especially abortion. And this silence can make women reluctant to share their experiences or to reach out for support for fear of being shamed or judged or stigmatized. We, our church, can do our part to bring these issues out of the shadows. Maybe Joan Baez is right, and action is the antidote to despair. Let me close with two actions for First Congo to consider. One, we can declare ourselves to be a reproductive freedom congregation. It's a designation offered by the group Just Texas, it's a way that churches in Texas can help to remove the stigma associated with abortion. All we have to do to become a reproductive freedom congregation is to publicly affirm three principles. We trust and respect women. We promise that people who attend our congregation will be free from stigma, shame, and judgment for their reproductive decisions, including abortion. And three, we believe access to comprehensive and affordable reproductive health services is a moral and social good. I'm going to make some more information available about becoming a reproductive freedom congregation, and we will take a congregational vote at our annual meeting in a couple of weeks. Please, in the meantime, reach out to me if you have questions about that or if you want to discuss it further. And here's the second thing we can do. We can adopt a clinic. We can build a relationship with Fort Worth Whole Woman's Health Clinic. What would that mean? 
It depends on what we want to do. Maybe we would train a team of folks who could show up and escort women into the clinic on days when they're mobbed with protesters. If morale is particularly low among staff and doctors, we could show up with food or cookies. We could train clergy and seminarians in our congregation on how to best provide pastoral care to women seeking care at Whole Women's Health. We might send encouraging cards to folks in the clinic or send care packages home with their clients. Who knows what we could do together to serve with compassion with this particular focus. There are so many ways our congregation can come together to serve with humility and compassion. And you know what? As we join together to build the kind of world to which love calls us, I don't think we'll be in despair anymore. And so today, on this Thanksgiving Sunday, we give thanks for community partners serving with dignity and compassion. We give thanks for action as a path out of despair. We give thanks for the opportunity simply to be of use, to love God by loving and supporting others.